Good afternoon, good evening. I'm not sure what time we are anywhere to everyone. And thank you so much for including us in this presentation. Um, we are speaking about the lived experience of borderline personality sort of from the family perspective and uh, a little bit about our TARA Family Empowerment Program and our family mentalization class and our new project called Mothers Standing Up for BPD. Uh, we are going to be joined by who is ever the U.S. She discovered Tarva BPD during the COVID epidemic. She found the approach extremely effective and has attended several Tara workshops and web webinars. She's very interested in the concepts that we believe in, such as uh, communication and compassion, and is going to speak about uh, how she views that. And is uh, somebody who is, he's a 65 year old, he would never look at, married man with three grown children, a long time employee of at where he, a devout Christian and an excellent writer. Uh, he has attended the Tara Family Empowerment Program and the mentalization class. He was so struck by mentalization in terms of him being that he has volunteered for subsequent classes where he provides the families with the astonishing perspective of BPD while the families are struggling with their own perspective. So what Tara is about, Tara is the Buddhist goddess of compassion. And Tara was founded in 1994 when we brought Marshall Linehan to New York City for the very first Borderline Personality Disorder DBT conference in the New York area. We had 350 people at that very first conference and launched DBT into New York City. We've been advocating for DBT programs across the country and have developed family workshops almost congruent with discovering Marshall Linehan. Um, what's the difference that makes Tara for BBD different? Uh, we are committed to science-based understanding of BPD. We include evidence-based treatments and neurobiological features. I personally have been trained in DBT by Marshall Linehan, in mentalization by Peter Fonagy and um, the wonderful Anthony Bateman, and have gone through hundreds of neuro neurobiological conferences with the leading researchers in the field. Uh, we train families to be compassionate therapeutic allies, and um, we aim to improve the quality of life for those with BPD. And not only that, we want to prevent suicide. So we are very realistic in teaching families that their job is to keep their loved one alive. We have a 10 week family empowerment training program that is um, virtual and we have an eight week family mentalization class. We include acceptance, radical acceptance of BPD and acknowledgement of the grief both from the family perspective and the lived experience of the person with BPD. We also include practicing self-compassion and we have just started a new group called Empowering Mothers to Stand Up for BPD where we're advocating for change. Our principal aim in the Tara method is to repair relationships, not fix problems. We bring awareness of triggers. We try to avoid escalations, increase trust, and primarily create a sense of safety for the person with BPD. We try to decrease frequency, intensity, and duration of escalations, heal estrangements, acknowledge mistakes and hurts that the family may have unknowingly um, created, and accept BPD as real and acknowledge the pain of living with BPD. When we do this work, we encounter many problems from families because families have been dealt a great deal of stigma and misinformation. So the first step for change is understanding BPD neurobiology, the role brain circuitry plays in behaviors of people with BPD. 
so much so that we can predict certain responses. We stress the ability to see the world from their loved one's experience, loved one's perspective. We realize how the loved one with BPD experiences emotional realities and processes information. We recognize and emphasize the role of shame as the common denominator of interpretations and reactions to situations in their loved one with BPD. We anticipate disruptions by avoiding triggering behaviors and practicing mentalization techniques to help the families develop compassion. We are primarily have discussed the lived experience of BPD families. They fail to find help in the clinical community. They have misdiagnosis and failure to diagnose as a common experience. We have a survey with uh, many, many responses over the years. And the average person with BPD receives at least five diagnoses before getting the diagnosis of BPD. And to this day, the diagnosis is withheld from children who are under 18, citing that it is not appropriate to diagnose them when the DSM changed this starting in the year 2000. We are, families are given iatrogenic advice by clinicians such as tough love, boundaries, neutral faces, residential treatment, they're over-medicated, and often the loved one is dropped from therapy. They are told that they're either uh, therapy resistant or they fail to meet certain criteria for DBT programs. At that point, the person goes back to their family. Insurance does not cover BPD treatment in the US and vast sums of money are spent trying to find treatment. Families are portrayed as toxic and it fosters estrangement and families are blamed for the illness with the invalidating environment biosocial theory, and that does a great deal of damage to family relationships. We have done grassroots surveys. We use the internet as a source for finding data. We recognize that our data is not as pristine as the data of the researchers, but we do create enough information to see that there's something to what we're looking at. We've had 2,613 responses to misdiagnosis and mistreatment. We have studied the relationship between BPD and immune disorders. One of the most amazing surveys we've done is evaluating shame experiences where we have close to 900 responses that make it very, very clear the role of shame in creating pain for people with BPD. It is a topic that must be addressed. It's the elephant in the room. And uh, we hope we have initiated some new studies in the research field calling attention to shame. We assess BPD and hospitalization and ER experiences, pointing out that this does a lot of damage to the patient. And we've explored the relationship between BPD, Asperger's and autism. And we found with a thousand responses that one out of four people with BPD has a relative, a close relative with autism or Asperger's. Our newest project, which is going out on the internet today, is a heightened sensory sensitivity survey, which we're very, very excited about. Over 25 years of listening to families and collecting data, we realize that almost every family member describes hypersensory sensitivity and hypervigilance. These are children from infancy on who are super sensitive to sounds, smells, taste, textures, voice tones, particular words, children who have trouble sleeping from infancy on. They have alexithymia, failure to be able to name their feelings, and dyslexia. To date, there's little or no data regarding what compromises, what comprises a normative range of sensitivity in infants and children. It is our belief that if we could identify this high sensitivity in children from an early age, along the lines of sensory processing disorder, that trainings could begin, as is done with autistic children, to avoid development of maladaptive coping methods. 
we also do a lot of work with mentalization. We love mentalization. It would do anything to see mentalization widespread uh, implementation in the United States. Mentalization helps families help their loved ones struggling with the pain of BPD. The highlights for the families is it clarifies intentions, decreases ambiguity, increases a sense of safety connection, and reduces a sense of threat for the person with BBD. It, it, mentalization alone decodes and translates BBD behaviors. It teaches the families to avoid language that might trigger arousal, such as shame, and improves the situation by usual, utilizing helpful tools of compassion, empathy, and acceptance. We have read studies that no matter what treatment is used, the more compassionate the therapist, the better the outcome. One of our principal methods of working with families is this new chart that we have done that Christian Schmal told me has everything on it. It's BPD features based on current research findings. We give this out in every webinar and every workshop, and it has 17 factors. Each one of these has research showing that it is valid. This will be on our website and you will be able to click on each one to find the resources, the research that provided us with this. It tells us that people with BPD um, suffer social rejection, self-referential processing, have a negative bias, have limited distress tolerance, are, um, have high aversive responses, uh, have memory deficits, have increased feelings of shame, that they have deficits in oxytocin and have difficulty trusting people. We have evidence that there's sleep disturbance starting in infancy. Alexithymia is a major feature where they can't tell you what they feel because there's a disconnect between the body and the language. They miss appropriate faces and they're hypervigilant. And the hypervigilance and hypersensitivity create a constant state of being unsafe. We've also started something called Moms Standing Up for BPD. We are committed to raising awareness of BPD, to decreasing stigma. We're obtaining greater support for people with BPD and their families. We want to promote changes to enable people with BPD the opportunity to access affordable evidence-based treatment and effective support services. We want to advocate to increase reach research. And we've been trying for years to get the National Institute of Mental Health to recognize the National Institute of Alcohol study of 35,000 people where they found that BPD is 6% of the population. We want to disseminate existing research and treatment. Any treatment that approaches people with BPD without giving them some awareness of the biological underpinnings of what they're living with, to me, does not make any sense. We want to develop new, more effective treatments and we certainly believe that the solution is, just as with cancer, where you have um, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, immune therapy, we believe that people with BPD need DBT, mentalization, compassion-focused therapy, and mindfulness training. And it is the combination of all of these that would be the, the greatest help. We want to decrease the enormous stigma, both public and professional, against BPD and against their families. Uh, we aim to create the vitally needed traumatic changes in understanding and treating BPD, and we are working to achieve what the medical world has not been able to accomplish for our loved ones with BPD. The Mother's Campaign's goals are to reduce the stigma, promote an increase in treatment availability and research, and to achieve what the medical world hasn't done. We have to point out that unacknowledged BPD creates a public health crisis. Uh, one out of three perpetrators of domestic violence meets criteria for BPD. 
They're the highest users of uh, the ER and uh, of inpatient hospitalization. They have one of the highest rates of suicide and they're suffering within the entire family. I'm not sure what the drug addiction rate is, but it varies between 67 and 70 something percent. The National Institute of Alcohol found that 76% of alcoholics meet criteria for borderline disorders, the, the percentages range from 40 to 70 percent, and there is about one out of three incarcerated people meets criteria for BPD. This is an outrage. Reframing the role of families is another goal of what we want to accomplish. Fully informed and committed families can actually be very helpful. Families can make a difference in helping to improve the lives of the person with BBD. They are not primarily concerned with reducing their burden. They are primarily concerned with reducing their loved one's burden of emotional pain in making sure their loved ones have a life worth living and that they are safe. The role of families in BPD is seen in a way parallel to the way families were seen regarding autism and schizophrenia. I call your attention to the work of Bruno Bettelheim, who absolutely vilified families. The effective role families can play in helping those with BPD is not generally supported as it is now in schizophrenia and autism. Stigma, stigma and parent blaming impedes research and dissemination of treatments. Families are there when the therapist drops the person from therapy. Families do not give up. They are oxytocin connected to their loved ones. And that relationship is one of the most important relationships that each person has. Uh, these are some statistics from an evaluation of our Tara family workshop. This is what happens after the workshop. Please note the frequency of episodes decreased. The ep intensity of episode, the duration of episodes decreased. The ability to de-escalate on the part of the family increased. Families were able to restore communication, to change their attitude, to avoid triggering, to recognize shame, to anticipate shame. They could feel compassion build trust, and improve quality of life. Additionally, the families remarked that our workshop helped them to radically accept BPD and their loved ones, to acknowledge the pain and the suffering of the BPD experience, to give up ideas that the person is manipulating them or doing things for attention or anything of that sort. They also were able to understand exactly what DBT and MBT do, the aims and how they could facilitate these treatments. The families felt less alone. They developed a community with other family participants, were more able to cope with their fears, and they could acknowledge the pain the person with BBD is living with. They developed self-compassion, which is a major uh, area we are working with today, which is to teach families self-compassion techniques and to understand the incredible need for advocacy to create change in BBD. So I thank you for your attention. Here's our contacts. And our next class begins on October 27th, and we have a big virtual meeting for mothers standing up for BPD that everyone is invited to join on Friday, October 17th at 7 p.m. U.S. time. We need all the help we can get, and I'm thrilled to hear the Australian people who are working, it seems, in the same direction we're working in, and um, hopefully... Um, we can make some changes. I now would like to turn the program over to who has been uh, working very hard at understanding how BPD ex affects families and what they can do about it. Thank you for your attention.
Dealing with BPD is like trying to read a book that is written in a foreign language for which you have no translation. You frequently cannot understand people with BPD and they cannot understand you. The confusion this creates is disabling, stressful, painful, irritating, and even enraging. It is often unclear to a family member what borderline loved ones want, and it can appear that they deliberately go out of their way to frustrate, defy, resent, and even lash out at family members. It is a behavior that seems to make no sense. In fact, the source of the confusion that arises when families try to relate to loved ones with BPD is that the person with BPD and the family member are both assumed to be speaking the same language and that their words, therefore, mean the same thing to both of them. It may never have occurred to you that this is not the case, that words can have a different meaning for someone with BPD and can therefore trigger unexpected responses. You may be unaware that your neurobiology might also be different from that of a person with BPD and that things that seem inconsequential to you could seem terrifying to someone with BPD. And you also may not know that people with BPD might not even be able to accurately identify feelings and emotions in themselves or others, let alone label them as others would. These and other insights gained through participation in Tara for BPD's workshops on family empowerment and mentalization can be jaw-dropping for family members. The evidence-based neurobiological and genetic explanations of how people with BPD experience the world reassure families that, as they had always suspected, their loved ones suffering from BPD were not inexplicably unstable, evil, unpredictable reprobates. On the contrary, the unique neurophysiology of BPD causes people with BPD to see and experience the world differently than most other people. Higher cortisol levels can lead to defensiveness and hypervigilance that anticipates the possibility of danger and vulnerability at every turn. Lower oxytocin levels make it harder for people with BBT to trust and to emotionally connect with other people, especially family members. And BPD people's vulnerable sense of self limits distress tolerance enhances sensitivity to criticism, and increases susceptibility to shame, all of which gives them the appearance of being highly defensive, unjustifiably prickly, and volatile. Tara for BPD's classes help people understand the fact that while they and loved ones with BPD use many of the same words to express themselves, the meaning of the words may be understood as something very different by the BBT person. A family member's careless comment, innocuous reference, or offhand suggestion may be interpreted as an affront or even an attack by a person with BPD. In short, the BPD person and other family members experience the world from two very different perspectives, which impacts how they express themselves and how they interpret each other's words. They are, in essence, each speaking a different language with no dictionary available to consult as to the real meaning and intent of what the other is saying. It's therefore not surprising that they often misinterpret one another which can leave them baffled, hurt, and confused. Through research findings, Tara for BPD has been able to identify features of BPD that can serve as a proxy for such a dictionary, 
by helping you understand alternative and unintended meanings that people with BPD may assign to your words. Likewise, Tara for BPD's insights into the often bewildering actions of people with BPD are invalu an invaluable aid in translating what BPD individuals are trying to communicate with their behaviors. Based on this research, Tara for BPD has developed techniques for interacting with BPD family members that can help resolve conflicts arising from miscommunication within families and restore trust and understanding between family members and their BPD loved ones. The skills Tara for BPD teaches need to be deftly applied in a myriad of situations every day because BBT escalations happen at the dinner table, in the garden, in the basement, on the playground, in the living room, and everywhere else in a home and at any time of the day. This requires not only becoming fluent with the techniques of mentalization, but also becoming very aware of feelings, your own and those of a BVD loved one. It is essential to acknowledge and respond to the feelings of the BPD person at all times. Why? Because a BPD person's feelings are who that person is at any given moment. Failing to engage with their emotions is tantamount to ignoring people, to not seeing them. Not being seen or heard is exceedingly painful for a person with BPD, as it is for anyone. It's a message that the person is irrelevant and disposable. Engaging emotionally with a BPD loved one's feelings assumes the person, excuse me, assures the person that he or she is not only seen, but also recognized, understood, and accepted. How does this look in actual practice? Well, consider your child, your teenager coming through the door, flopping himself or herself on the couch and blurting, this is the worst day of my life. My presentation was terrible. Everybody hated it. Typically, a loved one might then respond by trying to suggest things aren't really as bad as they seem. For example, you might say, I'm sure people didn't actually hate it. You're just exaggerating because you felt nervous about giving the presentation. Well-intentioned as this attempt to console a BPD person or loved one might be, it would probably only make him or her feel worse in that it doesn't convey recognition and empathy for how upset the person is. In fact, it even suggests that the emotions the person just expressed are inappropriate. A more supportive response might be, wow, it must feel terrible to think people didn't like your presentation. It's so painful and upsetting to feel misunderstood and unappreciated. Anyone would feel that way. By acknowledging and sharing a loved one's concerns about a situation, and by matching his or her tone of voice, you reassure the person that you recognize the current concerns and take them seriously. Then, to reframe, reframe the incident and help the borderline person put it in perspective, you could follow up with additional questions that might help him or her take a closer look at what happened, thereby de-escalating cortisol levels and engaging the person's prefrontal cortex. For example, you might say, how do you know they didn't like it? Or did people criticize you after the presentation? What did they say? Or maybe, were people paying attention? Or even, were people possibly tired from celebrating the Super Bowl yesterday? The goal here is not to settle or resolve the situation for PBD loved ones, 
but rather to clarify the intention of the situation with humility, thereby encouraging them to check the facts and to reframe the situation in a less emotionally charged way. Applying Tara for BBT's tools and techniques can and has restored loving, supportive relationships to many families and BPD loved ones. This restoration is not a cure for BPD, nor will it erase the neural, biological, and genetic factors that may cause people with BPD to experience the world somewhat differently than other members of a family. However, it can reduce the frequency and intensity of emotional outbursts, help develop closer ties between loved ones, and generate greater trust and empathy among family members. At the very least, this transformation of family life from war zone to safe refuge can encourage and support individuals with BBT to reach out for therapeutic assistance. Probably the biggest challenge in adopting any of Tara for BPD's tools is the changes required in yourself. Contrary to the sole focus of most families, understandably, that would be changing their BBT loved one. You, on the other hand, who need to concentrate on becoming a person who can embrace, radically accept, and love your BPD family member unconditionally, just as that person is at any given moment. It is incredibly difficult work. It's essentially letting go of something concerned family members desperately want to do, namely to fix the BBT loved ones to get them back on the right track and to get them to fulfill the family's vision for them. Instead, to truly help a person with BPD, families must accept the paths their loved ones choose, allowing them to explore explore who they are and discover who they need to become, not who the family needs them to become. Unfortunately, there are no easy fixes to achieve this goal. Families have to live their way through the problems that arise day in and day out, bringing to bear not only everything they can learn about this illness, but also a tenacious commitment to their loved ones and the lives their loved ones are struggling to establish. As disheartening and painful, as this process can sometimes be, its rewards can be staggering. The love, redemption, and fulfillment that come with re-engaging in a meaningful way with BBT loved ones are life-changing and have an incalculable healing impact that benefits every family member. It is a humbling, scary, difficult process. But if families hang in there long enough, accepting and loving their BPD through it all, these loved ones may begin trusting their families sufficiently to teach them who they are. The BPDs. And to teach them as well the person they need to become. And in this process, families may discover that person is not only someone they love, but also someone they like very much. It's a difficult process to navigate alone. Families need each other, not to compare war stories or outrages, but to inspire, encourage, and support one another in the difficult roles life has called upon them to play. They need to turn to each other because well-meaning friends and acquaintances simply don't understand their situation. Together, families need to keep applying the principles, insights, and skills that Tara for BPD has identified, as well as the experience, strength, and hope 
that families gain from one another. This process will not only restore trust in families' relationships with their loved ones, it will, as Tara for BBD points out, also create a safe emotional space, one that will allow both families and those struggling with BPD to dissolve the barriers to love, redemption, and fulfillment that have kept families locked in debilitating, anguishing conflict and stymied the ability of both families and BPD loved ones to grow and move forward with their lives. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm up now. Hi, thanks, Marsha. Marsha, that was wonderful. And Valerie. Yes. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I may zip through some slides otherwise I, uh, that I otherwise wouldn't have. Um, but uh, Hopefully it'll have meaning. So the title of, of my talk is What Have I Learned from Terra for BPD Mentalization Workshops? Okay. Um, the overview of my presentation, which is going to be a little bit condensed. I'll start off with how do I, who has BPD, see the world of relationships, specifically close relationships? Part two will be how mentalization has helped me. And part three will be skills I learned from Tara for BPD mentalization workshops. And by way of introduction, I'm, um, Valerie made me a one year younger than I really am. I'm 66. <laughs> I've had 41 years of therapy. Um, I've had the talk therapy the anti-abuse workshops, um, DBT training, counsel, uh, couples counseling, and mentalization through B Tara B for BPD. Okay. How do I, who has BPD, see the world of relationships? I have a prepared statement. It runs three minutes. Um, I hope uh, it's from my experience and um, I will begin. And this is how I see the world. I have little sense of self. By that I mean I'm not fully present. In close relationships, I tend to view myself from the outside looking in. I'm an observer of interpersonal relationships rather than a participant. I am, in a sense, a tabula rasa, a blank screen on which the other in the relationship writes on me. I offer nothing. I am there for the other person in my mind. I'm not a person in my own right. It's a type of dream state perpetuated by dissociation. And this dreamy world is threatened by close relationships because in close relationships, I have to be a separate person with his own thinking, feeling, and wanting. This pressure to be present and to be a real person is overwhelming to me. I am not clear on what I think, what I feel, nor what I want in the relationship. A simple question by the other in the relationship, such as what do you think can cause a panic? an existential crisis. At moments like that, I ask myself, am I a separate person? If so, do I have my own separate thinking, feeling, and wanting? If not, what am I? By that I, by that I mean, am I like other human beings? I'm sent into a world of embarrassment and of shame because I don't know what I think. Again, I view myself as being an observer of life not a participant. I scramble to cover this embarrassment and shame by not being able to identify what I think, feel, and want by attacking the other person, by saying things like, you're so arrogant, you're so opinionated, you're so stupid. The other person in the relationship is a threat to my dream state by asking me to be present. 
while I can occasionally enjoy the company of the other in the relationship, the moment the other asks me to define what I think, what I feel, or what I want, I choose fight, flight, or freeze. When I choose to fight, I become abusive and attack the other primarily for being present and having his or, own, his or her own thoughts, feelings, and wants. I'm filled with the stinking thinking of criticism and contempt. When I choose to fight, I use my words and logics to attack the other because he or she exposed my inability to think, feel, and want. When I choose flight, I answer the question or say, why are you always bothering me? Why are you trying to control me? Or I can't stand this relationship and wish you would go away. When I choose freeze, I stonewall and say, I don't care. I don't know. The next few slides are just teasing out a few of the points that I made in my talk. Just quickly, little sense of self, not fully present. Dreamy world is threatened by close relationships. The pressure to be present, to be a real person is overwhelming to me. A simple question by the other in the relationship, such as what do you think can cause a panic, an existential crisis. And uh, you know, by the way, I, I'm really not, in terms of when I'm in the moment, those moments of panic, um, I'm not being hyperbolic here in terms of existential crisis. <clears throat> I'm sent into a world of embarrassment and shame because I don't know what I think. Again, I view myself as being an observer of the, of the relationship, not a participant. Again, this interesting through mentalization, I came to realize, you know, this is why I'm attacking the other person um, because they're sort of exposing to myself and to themselves that I'm really not fully present. When I'm asked, hold on a second. There's a, I can't read that. When I'm asked to define myself such as what I think or feel or want, I choose to fight, flight, or freeze. Now it's not advancing. Hold on a second. I think I have to, there it goes. So part two is how mentalization has helped me. It has exposed to me really some amazing deep-seated beliefs and assumptions about my life, my relationships, and myself. <clears throat> For example, I'm jealous of people who are present and mindful. I ask you to con just concentrate on the the red words, so it's not so overwhelming to read all the text. Um, I also learned that I assume close relationships are a source of pain, pain of disappointment, disapproval, criticism, judgment, not being good enough. I assume close relationships will add to my shame, shame of not knowing who I am, shame of not knowing what I think the shame of not knowing what I feel and what I want. Mm. <clears throat> I found that the close relationship, I do not, I have lack of trust in close relationships. Um, I'm incredibly self-referential, many times termed narcissistic. Um, just reading the one bullet, there's no room in my disassociative bubble for another's thinking, feeling, and wants. And I'm sort of catastrophizing, always expecting the worst. Skills that I've learned from um, Tara. Excuse me, Christopher. Yes. I just want to let you know that there's uh, nine minutes left before we have to go to the next presentation. 
Sure. So it's up to you if you're going to continue or if we're going to go to the questions that are that have been posed. I will. I will uh, have. I have one more slide, and then we can go to Q and A. Okay, great. Thanks, Christopher. Okay, I had a list of many, many different skills learned from mentalization workshop. I'm going to give you in the next slide the four big takeaways for me. <clears throat> the need for curiosity about the other. Get outside the self-referential. Ask questions. Don't assume. It's the first. The second is humility with regard to the other. Remind myself that we're all flawed. And the sort of the, the attention and validation that I want from the other I can show helps with the humility. This mentalization has helped tremendously with honesty with self, radically, radically accepting I have BPD, you know, the neurobiological aspects. And finally, in closing, um, I've gained an appreciation of the relationship itself that I'm in as something prescient to be nurtured. And then I was asked also, excuse me, I'm just going to just the last slide is one that you've seen before is just the contact information. Uh, please contact uh, Tara for BPD with any uh, reactions, comments, or questions. Thank you very much for your time. I will stop share. Thank you all so very much. There was so much packed in there. And I, I want to remind everybody out there that uh, these will be these are being recorded. And so if you want to rewatch it and maybe catch some of the some of the really dense content that went through because there was so much in this presentation. Um, there's one question. Well, actually, what I want to say first is that I have put the website address in both the chat and the Q&A for people to find. Um, there were a number of questions of, of people wanting to know how they can access the programs provided by Terra for BPD. And I'm sure all of that information is on the website. And um, I know you have a group coming up very soon. Um, the question that's in the, in the Q&A right now, please add others if you have them, um, is how can you help families mend a relationship with an estranged child. And just before you answer it, I want to let you know that there's another comment in the Q&A, which is from somebody who did manage to rebuild a relationship um, with their adult son, whom they had not seen in nine years after having taken a family program through Terra. So um, that's a real, a real beacon of, of hope and light right there. But maybe Valerie or one of the others could uh, tell us a little bit more about what changes have to happen in order for this to occur? Uh, we suddenly started a workshop on estrangement and were astonished to find how many people in the BPD world were estranged from their loved ones. And um, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, a lot of this comes when the person enters therapy and they're told that their family invalidated them. And that's the reason why they have these problems. Mm -hmm. And the family is feeling guilty and responsible. And the, and it just sets up a tremendous tension and uh, a great deal of, of stress. A lot of the things that Chris has taught us also explains where the estrangement comes from. When we started the estrangement workshop, we were overwhelmed with how many areas this has to cover. You have to be able to understand how you see the situation, how the borderline personality disorder person sees you, and the family needs to have the humility that Marsha was describing to be able to apologize and to realize what they're apologizing for. 
it requires a tremendous amount of work on the part of the family member to apologize for what they don't really understand they're apologizing for. And with that understanding, when they are honest and authentic, they can begin to repair the relationship. Uh, it is a goal of Tara's work to repair those relationships. We believe strongly that the parent and child are connected neurobiologically from the get-go with the strongest connection that exists with any relationship. And the work to bring those relationships together is neglected in most therapy. The family is not toxic. The family is uneducated and doesn't know what to do. They don't understand. The person with BPD, it's like two people who are driving in a car and they get to a stoplight and one screams at the other, why are you stopping? The light is green and the other person says the light is red when what they're really saying is one person is colorblind and the other person doesn't know it. The person doesn't know it. So we work on establishing communication, but it's very, very difficult for the family to make the first step when they feel that the borderline owes them an apology. It doesn't work like that. So you have to do things that are anti-intuitive and work very hard, but we've had some remarkable results and that's really warms my heart because the pain of estrangement is unbearable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do either uh, have anything to add to that? I do not. I think that is true. I think that the pain often is so paralyzing that people are just stuck. They don't know how to get out of it and they can't even think straight. So um, one of my mantras is stop the pain and we can all start thinking about what to do, but you have to stop the pain. Great. Thank you so very much for being here. I, I know that some of the words came up through your presentation, but I really want to sort of highlight the fact that you, you bring a lot of compassion, both for people with borderline personality disorder and so much compassion and understanding for the families as well. Um, your work is so very important. Thank you so much for having taken the time to be here with us today and share all of your insights with the audience. Um, so I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. I hope you're able to listen to some of the other presentations and thank you again for being here. Bye. Thank you for doing all this hard work to get it together. <laughs> and so nice to meet you, Valerie, after all the emails we've exchanged to make yes, this thank happen. You. Lovely You've to meet you. You've done a terrific job. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Take thank care. You. Thank you.